lot of it was was made. It was true. Uh, I seen I seen a lot of it that you know they made the drama themselves by what they did. The decisions that they made caused that drama, or the weather itself. Let's get it, Marcel in the building. So, thank you uh, for coming in the building and sitting down with me. I do appreciate it. Um, so, you reached out to me, and and from what I gathered in the background, you you got a couple of topics that you want to go over with me, but the main interest that kind of caught my fancy is you're you're a female truck driver down in Alaska that's driving on the ice roads so you're considered an ice road trucker yes even though I'm not driving on a cube I still drive on the ice a lot of people don't know that there's more than just the ice road up north all of our roads have ice on them in the winter ice road trucking up in Alaska, man. So how is that? Tell me the difference between reality TV and what you guys do in the real world. In the real world, uh, we, we, our ice cube is not quite as big. It's just the highway. And uh, you, you really are not driving across the ice. You're gliding across the ice. And you're carefully doing that, not touching your brakes, and you're going up these hard pulls. Uh, you're just being really, really careful to glide safely. And, and you can do that without ever touching your brake. If you're skillful enough, you know, four million miles, you should know what you're doing. Do you guys uh, get paid more? Like, how, how do you guys get paid for doing something dangerous like that? Well, there's no, <laughs> there's no extra pay for that. It's just that I, I get to go home every night. Uh, $25 an hour is, is kind of low, but I, I was very proud to, to take that because it wasn't very far. It's only like 180 some miles on those runs, unless I went to Fairbanks. And then that paid just a little bit more. I think it was like $600 for a trip to Fairbanks. So you you got to be happy and and want to drive for that. I guess some people might think that was a little money, but it bounced up. I mean, twenty five dollars an hour. Uh, twenty five dollars. Twenty five dollars an hour. It, it's it's not bad for a beginning or for a beginner driver, but. For somebody to be driving those those conditions, that to me is kind of low. Like you literally you literally putting your life on the line for twenty five dollars an hour. Yeah, well, let me add something to that. <laughs> Not only are you pulling one trailer, you're pulling two fifty three foot trailers up a hard pull. We have a hard pull there called Honolulu. <laughs> uh, I've only been up that with a 53-footer, not a set of doubles, but these guys do this every night without incident. And every once in a while, we get a rookie who doesn't know what gear to be in going up the hill, and he spins out. And when he spins out, we're communicating on the radio. We know we're going to have to get out in the left lane and go around this guy to keep from spinning out. Alaska has some really good drivers when it comes to maneuvering those set of doubles going up the hill. Oh, yeah. And they learn really quick what they did wrong because they're sitting on top of the hill, spun out, and they're going to set three railers on to get unstuck. And that's how I was taught. You only put on chains if you're stuck. Yeah, so what about chains? I mean, do you guys drive with chains up there? I'm assuming y'all do, right? 
We hang. We yeah. We got we got the hard work. We got three railers. They call them three railers. A good driver will never need to put them on unless he's pulling a heavy set. And he knows how to use his hardware. And with communication between the lot of us, we know we may have to chain up. We may have to drop one trailer at the top of the hill and go back and get the other trailer. These guys are really good. So Ice Rose Truckers, what what that used did did that come on A and E or what 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 channel did that used to come Discovery. on? History History Channel. So it used to come on the and, History and Channel. Yes, that road it, 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 that road is very dangerous. If you are a rookie and you go too fast, you could cause you could cause the major waves in the ice. And it, if uh, during breakup. When the ice is melting, that's when it's very critical. How much of that? How much of that program do you think was was actually true to what you guys do? There, Don Corleone. I need a man who has powerful friends. I need a million dollars in cash. I need Don Corleone. Those politicians that you carry in your pocket, like so many nickels and dimes. Uh, a lot of it was. Was made. It was true. Uh, I seen. I seen a lot of it that, you know, they made the drama themselves by what they did. The decisions that they made caused that drama, or the weather itself. And their experience sometimes they're overconfident. I was interviewed for the Ice Road Truckers series, but I didn't have enough drama. Lisa got the part. You can see my YouTube interview. I have on a red coat. I was standing outside in Toke, Alaska at two below zero. My daughter is taping me, answering the question that she's holding to the left side. And it's funny when I watch it now, because at the time I was driving for big state logistics in Valdez, pulling a set of tankers to the tank farm, having a ball. Okay, so you was interviewed by Ice Road Truckers for the program at one point. Yes, I got a hat, IRT hat, but I didn't have enough drama. How did I drive? So wait, so wait, what, what, what do that mean, that, that you didn't have enough drama? Like what, the producers was trying to... Uh, look or try to make you uh, produce some drama. What what was the what was the onboarding process was like? Uh, they give you these questions, and as you answer the questions, you you address how you would handle certain issues. And I was just too countryfy, I guess. <laughs> That's all I can figure. Lisa Kelly got Lisa Kelly got the part. She's much prettier than I, and you know, a pretty young trucker to play the part. She did a very good job. Did they did they reach out to you or you reached out to them? Uh, I reached out to them and then they sent me the questions and Lisa got the part. So you said that your daughter did the did the video. So you had to do you had to do the questionnaires via video? Yes, and send it in. And you can see that video. Uh, well, right now I won't tell you tell you how to find it, but later I will disclose that. How how long have you been how long have you been driving uh, since the series came and asked you? Like how long you was driving up to that point? Eleven years at that time, but I have a total of twenty three plus years, and. Over four million safe miles driving. Never had an accident. Never had a ticket. Clean inspections. When you look at my truck, you will see me with both hands on the wheel, and I'm looking straight ahead, watching my mirrors. So. Wow, that is that's an that's awesome crazy. that's an awesome accomplishment right there, man. Four million miles calculated.
Uh, is that is is that four million miles calculated uh, through varies uh, vary of varies of companies, or was that all calculated through yes. like maybe one or two companies? Uh, there's probably a total of six six different companies. Uh, I started out with a company called Polar Roller Express, which got a bad rap because they kept turning over. <laughs> but it was an honor to me. The day I got out of school, my husband, my late husband now, he passed away, he pulls into the school with a brand new Volvo. And all the students are looking out the window. I didn't know it was him at the time, but he came to the school, arranged it with the school, and picked me up that day in a brand new Volvo. And we started driving for uh, IGA out of Delta Junction for several years, he and I. Wow. He was leaving me. He was leaving me in the cabin. It was like 65 below zero while he went out and drove three weeks at a time for a company called Vic Hoskins. And he come in. He'd been gone three weeks. And I said, Jim, I said, I'm tired of you leaving me behind. It's so it's cold here. He said, okay, when you when I get back on this next trip, you have your bags packed. You're going to school. And we're going to drive team. And that's what we did. February 2000, I got my CDL, and I've had it ever since. Because of that, because of that, I have a job today. When he passed away, I went and got a job driving by myself. And that's a lot of what I said on the interview. There were things that he did because he was my husband. He was the mechanic. He did all the hard stuff, and I did the driving. You know, he drove, but he drove more than I because he, too, had those 4 million-plus miles of driving. And I depended on him. So when he passed away and I get this job driving a truck by myself, I have to learn how. You're not too tired, are you, Tom? Huh? Oh, I slept on the plane. Huh? Yeah, there's so lots of notes here. Now, Salazzo is known as a Turk. How to put the chains on by myself, how to check, do the things that I really didn't know how to do. And that was one thing that Jim told me. When you get out of school, you want to learn how to really drive the truck. Learn by the book. And that's what I did. I'm still doing it today. Uh, so your husband was your yeah uh, because I didn't want him to pick up and leave me there. We got a we got a house sitter, so the guy sit our house while we were out on the road, and so he pretty much looked after our house and and we had a little cabin around back. So when we come in, we would just go to that cabin and stay while Mike took care of the cap our house per se. So yeah, one one trip. When we took off, we had a little dog. It was a Snalshitsa Kapsalasa, and we called him Spanky. And some of the times he went with us on the truck, and he would jump up in the truck, and, and before you knew it, his feet were laying down. He was ready to go. So we started leaving him at home, and he would chase after the car as we were coming in. He knew it was us, so he'd come running after the car. And when we took off and left for the road, Mike was going to the store, and he hit Spanky and broke his neck. And Mike had to call us and tell us, hey, I'm going to have, have to get your advice here. Uh, they said that Spanky's quality of life isn't going to be good. <laughs> Should we put him down? So we told him yes. That was a sad moment not to be at home when your pet dies. But stuff happens. You just have to go on. Man, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. That's a tragic story. Uh, four four million miles, man. That's I'm 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 still flabbergasted over over that huge accomplishment right there. Was you uh was you recognized for the uh for the accomplishment? I I get I suppose I can still be recognized for it. I've never had an accident. I've always maintained my CDL, but. Who's going to do the recognition? You know, you kind of need the logbook. 
which if I with a little effort, I probably could find the log books, but it, it, it doesn't really, it's not that important to me. I know what I can do. You're 20 years now. Uh, if Ice Road Truckers was to come back, you you think you'll be able to uh, be able to get in the this time around? If, I don't know if, if I could ever, ever come back on TV. <laughs> but I would sure make an attempt at it. You know, I did have a company out of Canada approach me and wanted me to take the film crew along with me on Alaska's roads during the winter. And that may happen. But it's kind of complicated because they have to have a driver of the truck and a camera guy beside the truck. So in the winter on the ice, that's probably not such a good idea. But that's really the only way you can do it, you know, when you're filming. So aside from uh, ice road trucking in Alaska, um, you say you also do the lower 48 uh, states here in the U.S., uh, but you want to you want to tip on uh, young drivers understanding what they're getting into as far as uh, all miles paid, and you 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 want to touch on the fact that the difference in uh, of what these companies is offering as far as how they pay out, one of which is zip to zip. Uh, pay, which I was up under when I drove for U.S. Express. Uh, another one is practical mile pay, which is the actual miles off the off the uh, truck itself. And you have another one called actual miles driven. Go ahead and touch on uh, all three uh, and you, how that pertain to you. You take the zip code and zip code. And normally, if you read the definition of zip code to zip code, there shouldn't be a catastrophic difference in the zip code to zip code versus the practical miles. They should be pretty close. So, working for this one company with the way they figure it, zip code to zip code is like $82,000 a year. We're figuring it my way, which is the miles that I drive, and I don't go grocery shopping. I don't rack up miles. It's unnecessarily uh, that I shouldn't do. I do two one dots to the other, straight there, park, unload, and hit the road back home. $90,000. So there's a little bit of difference there. Does that make sense to you? I can give you the break. Yeah, I could give you that breakdown. I did do a chart on it, but I don't have it in front of me right at the moment. Let's see if I can pull that picture up here. When I was working for you or driving for U.S. Express, um, I, I couldn't understand it myself because I'm looking at, like, I get the load assignment, and on the load assignment it says, you know, uh, let's say it's like 1,500 miles. Right. But but the actual miles that I actually drive is like an extra three or four hundred miles. Like I I will call them up and I will question that. Like, bro, I'm I'm leaving about an extra two, three hundred miles on the on the table. Why is that? And the only way they can explain it to me is that, well, we we you know we just do miles based on zip code to zip code. I was like, okay, well why not why not do the miles from when I actually drive? Well, they figure if I don't go the route that let's say if they assign me a particular route and I veer off that route, that's why I don't get paid for the actual miles driven because sometime it is true. You can probably drive 1,500 miles to your destination, or you can drive uh, an extra two, 300 miles to your destination, depending on the route that you take. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's understandable, but some of you guys is going, you know, at that time, I'm still a rookie and I'm still learning. So at that time, I noticed 
that some of the routes that they would give us is Google Maps routes. Like they'll go, instead of giving us the practical route, they would give us the fastest route. And that's what they'll give us. And I'm sitting there like, okay, well, the practical route is, and I'm using the low end, the practical route is like 600. The route that you given us to take is 550. But the practical route to actually take is 600. Why not give us the sit why why not just go ahead and give us the practical route so we can just get there, you know, instead of getting there fast because you know we according to Google Maps, you know, you trying to save 10, 15, 20 minutes and that's not always the case in the real world you know you you'll get stuck in traffic you'll get you you'll get hemmed up or whatever so why not just go in and just give us the the practical route with the with the more practical miles i said that i would see because i heard that you were a serious man to be treated with respect. It, knowing what to look for, uh, geez, that's really hard to explain. You have to you have to know the terminology uh, because as a I've been a new student before, and you're just kind of in shock, and you're glad you got a job, and and uh, you know you just started. So uh, not wanting to shake anybody's tree would be a problem for the student. But this is your livelihood. This is your paycheck. This is how you are going to get paid. And if you don't say something about it when you first start, you're going to be stuck with it. So don't be bashful. Go right to the juggler vein and ask them, how much per mile? And if it ain't what you want, don't go there. you got a choice. You can accept what they're going to pay you, uh, but now I'm talking with over four million miles, so uh, and my driving record is impeccable. So I feel like I could ask for that. I feel entitled to that. Uh, I slipped on my own and let it happen to me, but that was my choice. <laughs> December fifth. 2022, my mother passed away. And I was on the road and I couldn't go home. And that was really devastating to me because she was my mom. But she told me, you're my Rose. I understand whenever you cannot come home, you're so far away. But it was still something that I wanted to do. And then if that wasn't enough, June the 5th, six months through the day, my sister passed away. And praise the Lord, he got me home because of this company. He got me home, and I got to see my sister. Although she passed away, I did get to see her, and she was cremated. I got some of her ashes. But this is real life, you know? It's things that is going to happen to you when you're out on the road. You need to think about this. If your mom dies or your dad dies, your brother, your sister, God forbid, anybody in your family dies, just know you're out on the road. What will you do? The time to think about that is before you get in the truck, take possession of it. And then there's the other factor. Okay, so my my family, somebody in my family passed away. I, I have this truck. I can't get home. Don't leave the truck. That goes on your record for the rest of your life. Do not abandon your truck. I've heard people do that. It's so It's so not right. It also depends on um, 
the company that you choose to drive for as well. Um, my condolences, my condolences goes out to you, um, Marcel. Um, definitely, definitely um, understand the feeling because my stepfather passed early this year and uh, I was lucky enough to see him before he passed. But it was unfortunate that I wasn't able to be there at the funeral, even though my company knew well in advance. And shout out to my fleet manager for, you know, getting me uh, in route uh, to the house so I could be there for the funeral. Unfortunately, the receipt, not the receiver, the, the shipper where I was at, kind of was the main reason or the culprit while I was late uh, getting back to the, you know, getting back to the house and and to be there to uh, see my, you know, to pay my respects to my stepfather. So I, I know the feeling. It's just unfortunate that a lot of people, a lot of new drivers, a lot of millennial drivers that's that's coming into this industry right now, they they really don't understand the severity of uh of of what could happen. What could happen if you can't get home to your kid if your kid is sick or kid is hurt? What could happen if your you know one of your family members pass and you're 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 down in in nowhere, you know? So it's it's all about the company that you really would do your research. I mean, I, I talked to some drivers that had some real horror stories with, with companies not, you know, not getting them home, sitting them, you know, just doing all sorts of things. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of these new drivers just, they seem, they seem not to understand. Yeah, bloated compressors, gases. <laughs> but we caught it on the free trip. Yeah, that's, it, that's a really important you know, uh, it is a commitment, and the decision that you make can affect you the rest of your life, whether you like it or not. These are things that could happen, might happen. God forbid they do not happen. And do not forget to make Jesus Christ your co-pilot. I for seven. Here it is. I'm laying it at your feet. Done. Over, done with God. You know, he's the only one who can hear you. He's the only one who can really take care of you. And just just do the right thing. Investigate. Check out the reputation. And don't go there if you get all this bad stuff. Because you're going to be stuck there for a while. It's not going to be overnight. You're going to get in and get out if you don't like it. Or you might, you, you <laughs> might get out yeah, right when you never, get there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go to or you go to you go to orientation and feel yeah. like, uh-uh, yeah. no, nah, we're good. And Bye. luckily you can do that, <laughs> but you're not going to get your orientation paid. And uh, anyway, it, it, there's there's a lot of things that I could say. There's a lot of things I could tell you. And it, it, just everybody, be careful. You know, I met in 1989. I was, I was kidnapped, can you believe that, by a truck driver. You want to hear that story? What's the matter with you? I think your brain is going soft from all that comedy you're playing with that young girl. Never tell anybody outside the family what you're thinking again. I, I, I left, I took off to Texas in my 1979 Oldsmobile, heading to Brownville, Texas. And being a, from a trucking family somewhat, I, I took a CB radio and I put it in that car with one of those long whip antennas so I could talk. I could talk a little bit, so I got to talk to this guy, 
and uh, from uh, Virginia all the way to the Tennessee line, there to the visitor center. Yeah, I talked to this guy, and he was, he was really nice. And he says, yeah, we're going to go in here and eat, eat supper. And, and he was talking to his wife on the phone. I felt pretty good. Uh, so he gets in his truck, and I get in my car, and we go on up the road. He gets back on the phone. I think we've been driving another couple of hours. We're, we're near Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, he says, yeah, we're going to get off this exit here. And it was the I-9540, I the only place where they cross, I-95 or I-96. Anyway, it, they only cross in one place, and that, it crossed right there. And a couple of kids, uh, being attentive to the detail, I remembered seeing a big rooster there. There's a Dickens Motel there. I remembered seeing that rooster outside. And, and the reason I mentioned that is because had I not remembered that, Later, I would not have found my car ever. So we're sitting in the we're sitting in there drinking iced tea, and like a dummy, I get up and go to the bathroom. Eh, what does he do while I'm in the bathroom? He laces my tea. When I come out and sit down and I kick the tea up and I took a drink, I do not remember getting in his truck. I do not remember driving down the road. I do remember waking up with a smashing headache. I sit up in the sleeper. This is a really nice truck. He's a really nice looking truck driver. He had on a black hat and a beard and mustache. So he was a very attractive young man. And I'm sitting up in the sleeper and I look down and I'm watching him like, gosh, where are we? And it's dark outside. And I, I just start looking around and I see my keys hanging on his toggle switch. And I'm like, oh, that's good. Okay, so now what are you going to do? You're in here with this truck driver, and you don't know where the crap your car is. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, shit, this is not good. So I start thinking, how am I going to get out of here? So we drive and drive and drive. We come through the scale house, and I'm thinking, well, maybe if I make hand signals or something, they might see. So I took my left hand and put it up, and I was pointing with my right hand towards the window. Like, they weren't paying attention. They could care less what was going on. So we keep traveling on down the road after we come through the scale. And uh, we were getting near the truck stop at Memphis, Tennessee. And this lady comes over the radio and she says, I have shower pass here. All you got to do is come and get it. I said, shower? I haven't had a shower in a couple of days. Oh, that would be so nice. I said, and so he gets back on the radio. He said, yeah, we'll take him. And so he pulls it into the truck stop there at Memphis, some big truck stop. I'm, I figure it was probably a TA or flying day, but I cannot remember it. In 1989, was a little, a little time back there. So I get out, and I'm thinking, I see my keys, and I went to reach for them. He says, you don't need those. And I'm like, oh, this is really good. So I had told him, I said, my husband is going to call the state troopers if I do not call him at 12 o'clock. And it was like 15 minutes till 12. Big lie. Big lie. I had no intention of calling my husband, but I was going to try to call somebody. So he walks in there with me, and he's right behind me. He's right behind me, so I couldn't run. And we walk over to the payphone. At that time, the payphone was the item. So walk over to the payphone, and I picked up the phone, and I punched a bunch of numbers, 800, yada, yada, yada. And as soon as he looked away, I hung up, and I punched 911. <laughs> she answers. 911 operator, what's your emergency? I said, uh, I'd like to speak to the St. Albans Hospital. She says, no, this is not the St. Albans Hospital. I said, yeah, I want to speak to the St. Albans Hospital. She said, this is 911 emergency operator. Are you in trouble? I said, yes. Somebody there with you? Yes. Can you say what he looks like? No. If I tell you, if I give you a couple of suggestions, you can say yes or no. I said, okay. So she said, what color hair, yada, yada, yada. We went on down. She said, in two minutes, you're going to look over to the left, and you're going to see the state troopers walk in. And when you see them walk in, I want you to drop the phone and walk straight over to them. And that's what I did, and that's how I got away. And how I got back to my car, that's another story. <laughs> oh, it's too long, and my battery will die. I will save it for another day. It's another story. I, I, I met, I met it, I met on the, and so I had $500. I'll, I'll be really quick with it. I had $500 in my pocket. And that's what he told the troopers. 
that he was trying to protect my money. I'm like, well, geez, it's only $500, but he's trying to protect my money. He said, she's crazy anyway. And I, I said, well, you're, you're holding me against my will. I do not want to go with this guy. And so I got my stuff and I said, my, my duffel bag is out in his truck and my keys are hanging on his toggle, his toggle switch. So they walked out with me. I said, uh, this guy's got little, little brown bottles under his feet. He says, we can't do nothing about it without a search warrant. Are you going to press charges? I wanted to press charges so bad that he knew where my car was and I did not. So I said, no, I don't want to press charges. He says, well, that's all we can do. If you're not going to press charges, he, he gets to leave here scot-free. We cannot, we cannot inspect this truck without a search warrant. So I got my bag and my keys and I said, okay, I'm just going to take my chances. And he left. Steven, the type of topics and links that I see people talking about. Oh, good grief. Anyway, he. Are you the ones that are <laughs> you sharing Hang on, technology fails me. Okay. So anyway, I get I get out of the car and this lady that was there, she says, Oh, I have your towels for your shower. And I wasn't I didn't feel like taking no shower. I'm just thinking about how I'm gonna get back to my car. So uh, anyway, she said there's a Greyhound terminal here, you could get a ticket and go go wherever your car is and so I got to look it on the map and I couldn't remember what exit was. What exit my car was. I couldn't remember the I-90, I 40, whatever it was, I had to look it up on the map. I could not remember where that was. Uh, I could barely remember the rooster, but that didn't come to later. So I get on the Greyhound bus, and I'm thinking about what kind of stupidity I had just done. And I'm sitting there looking out the window, and this little Hispanic guy gets on and sits down beside me. And he, he was short and cute and and he kept looking over at me, and he says, oh, are you having a bad day? I said, don't even go there. And I just turned back to the window and looked out. He says, oh, he says, I'm going to Cooksville, Tennessee, to see my mom. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm listening. At now, now, the good Lord, like I said, does take care of me. And this was one of those times. This young man, he, he was going to his mother's to get his Ford pickup truck. And he was offering to take me back to find my car because I did tell him the sob story. And so I ended up in Osceola, Texas. And I was there for probably three or four weeks, long enough to even get me a job at Skipper B there in Burleson, Texas. Got a job there. And uh, I worked for a couple of days in a boat assembly factory. And I didn't understand what kind of area I was in, that this is a tornado zone. And one day I was working at the table, and this great big old bullfrog comes hopping in and gets under the table. What the heck is going on? She says, there's going to be some weather here, that little lady did, that was showing me how to do this job. And lo and behold, there was a tornado come right by there and took that building down. And it, But you should have seen these balls of hail that come down and burst the windshield. So anyway, back to the story. So I get on. And I have enough money saved that I could pay this man for the gas. And he says, okay, so we're not going to go in the Ford pickup. We're going to go in this Nissan Pulsar. And it's very good on gas. We're going to go in that, and we're going to get off on every every exit all the way back to Cookville, and we're going to find your car. Well, we did that, and next to the last exit, there sat my beautiful Burgundy and White Oldsmobile. And I could have... I could have just kissed the guy forever. But anyway, that, that's how it come out. The good Lord got me back to my car, and I went back home to Virginia, and I stayed there. And I learned a very valuable lesson. Don't leave your drink sitting on the table and then go back and drink it. <laughs> wow, that was an interesting story, man. I do appreciate it very much that you uh, shared that with me, man. Damn. I guess I'm up under the understanding that the company told you one yes. thing, but it, it turned not, out to be another. We, we were not told it was zip code to zip code. It was never. Yeah, and I wouldn't have known because I, I lived a sheltered life in Alaska. They just paid you the miles you drove. <laughs> I, I didn't know I needed an interpreter for that. But now I found out, and I'm much wiser now, 
So I will ask any company that I go to work for, do you pay zip code to zip code or do you pay practical miles or do you pay me for all the miles I drive? I think those are. I think those are very, very good questions that that, that start asking. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna write that down for my next yes. MTC series of questions. Uh, do you guys play? Do you guys pay practical miles, or do you guys just pay zip to zip? Ask that as the first question. Do you pay zip code to zip code? <laughs> I think you'll get ninety nine percent yes on that. I will ask that. I will ask that. Well, Marcel. Uh, you said that you have a have a upcoming interview, so hopefully we can get back together and uh, talk about driving explosives yeah, in, at, I mean, in Alaska. All right, so you take it easy, you stay safe out there, and uh, hopefully we'll hear from you again. I appreciate your time, and everybody, be safe. Go get what you what you want for pay. Do not settle for less. Big G's got it locked.